Okay. So I want to uh, hit record. I want to um, begin to introduce the climate section of the class. And um, we really need to go back to a topic from the history of Mars exploration that we didn't get around to covering because we got snowed out so many times. And that's the work of Kepler and uh, his development of uh, his laws of planetary motion. Anybody recall from the readings back then or from what I sent around recently, what are the three laws of planetary motion that Kepler came up with? Study guide, Kepler's laws will be on the exam. Okay. So three laws of planetary motion. You, you can tell he, he worked back several centuries ago, many centuries ago, because uh, his work is talked in terms of laws. You know, this is back in the uh, olden days when uh, the idea was to find laws of nature. Uh, but Kepler's laws of planetary motion basically uh, come down to three. Uh, first, that planets... Uh, travel around the sun in elliptical orbits. Uh, so the law of ellipses. Um, the second law basically talks about the uh, motion along that ellipse. And basically uh, it is, uh, generally speaking, that um, it's often called the law of equal areas, which is a very strange way to think about it that doesn't make intuitive sense to most students. But basically, uh, planets as they move around their orbit, and, and these are very geometrical laws because Kepler was at heart a mathematician, um, planets will, will uh, sweep out equal areas in equal times. So if a planet is moving you know, six months around the, in its orbit when it's far away from the sun, it will sweep out this area that is long and narrow, but when it's closer to the sun, it will sweep out this uh, broader and flatter area, and those areas will be equal. That doesn't really, you know, float my boat or rock my socks very much. What it really means is that when planets are in the part of their orbit when it's close to the sun, they go faster. So the speed at which the planet orbits around on this elliptical path is not constant, uh, but instead will, the planet will speed up when it comes closer to the sun, and it will slow down as it goes further away from the sun in its orbit. These first two have a very big impact on understanding the weather and climate on Mars. So we'll deal with those in much more detail. The third one is that uh, um, if you take the distance of the planet to the sun in terms of its semi-major axis and you cube that, uh, that will be equal to the square of the period of the time it takes to go around the sun. The period is essentially the year for the planet, okay? One year on the Earth is the time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. One Martian year is the time it takes Mars to go around the sun once. That's the period of its orbit. Same thing with Jupiter. Um, and so Kepler's third law was a way to relate how far away the planet is from the sun in a very mathematical sense to how long its year is, how long its period around the sun is. So um, planets that are further away from the sun, do they have longer or shorter years than the Earth? Longer. And the further out in the solar system you go, the longer it gets. I mean, by the time you get out to Jupiter... No, it's much, much more than that. Yeah. 
And if you go out into the Oort cloud, you have things that are orbiting the sun that take hundreds of thousands of years to complete an orbit around the sun. Okay. So, uh, I mean, you can see that as the distance cubes, that, that, that distance cubed term will, will increase very rapidly the further out you get. And then you take the square root of that to get the, the time it takes the planet to go around. You see that that, that time um, increases very rapidly. Now, uh, we're introducing uh, weather here and climate, but I do want to take a little bit of time to give Kepler's laws justice since we didn't have time to do it earlier. This first law, the law of ellipses, was actually the second law he came up with. He actually came up with his law of equal areas first, but they were pretty much part of the same package, and they're usually phrased in terms of you know, Kepler's first law being elliptical motion and the second law being this diff distance in in speed. I just want you to appreciate what this guy did and be amazed about it. Okay, this is before telescopes. It's clearly before computers and calculators. What were the data that Kepler was working with? Observations of what? Of the position of Mars and Jupiter and the Sun and the Moon and the sky. Naked eye astronomy, all that Kepler had was data on, and this particular night, at this time of that night, Mars was, you know, this many degrees above the horizon, this many degrees away from the azimuth, and so forth. That's the kind of data. Now, uh, Brahe, the guy he was working for, had years and years of very detailed data, but again, it's pre-telescope, it's all naked eye, uh, basically measuring angles. Kepler wanted to take those observations that were made in kind of a geocentric view. I mean, from the Earth, Brahe and others were measuring the position of the sun and the planets in the sky. What Kepler wanted to do as a Copernican, as someone who thought that the solar system was arranged around the sun, what he did was basically take all of those observations and said, well, okay, if I imagine that the Earth and these other planets are going around the Sun, then I need to translate these observations that have made, made from the Earth into a framework where the Earth is going around the Sun. And so, I mean, if you can imagine that, if we now have the Sun and we've got the Earth going around the Sun, and we've got another planet like Mars going around the Sun. Then for every specific data point in Brahe's collection and, and others, uh, Kepler basically had to say, okay, well at this time of the night on January whatever, from the Earth here, Mars was off in this direction compared to the direction of the Sun. And he had to translate every single data point using that kind of frame of reference. And then be able to, um, from that data, realize that no, Mars is not going in a perfect circle around the sun. And no, Mars is not going around at constant rate. So, um, like I say, I just hope you, you find out that you, you realize just uh, what a what a job this was to, to accomplish. Clearly uh, very important for revolutionizing our view of the solar system to put the sun in the center. I want to just give you kind of an intuitive feel for, for why a planet might go around the sun in an elliptical orbit and why it might uh, be going uh, at different rates as it is in different parts of its orbit. So if you think of a planet here like Mars, uh, it's red, so let's call it Mars. Uh, at this point in its orbit, Mars is heading off in this direction. But it doesn't continue in a straight line. It sweeps around in an ellipse. What is the, pro what is the factor, what is the force that is causing Mars not to continue off in a straight line but to go around in an ellipse? Okay, so the gravity, the sun is pulling on Mars, 
And just in a qualitative sense, you know, that's going to cause the orbit not to go off in a straight line, but to continually curve around. And then as Mars moves around to this point and is heading in this direction, again, we're going to have the gravity of the sun pulling, the, causing the orbit to the veer off. You keep doing that. And in the case of planets going around the sun, or moons going around planets, or, you know, basically any uh, body orbiting uh, another massive body, you end up with this kind of elliptical path. Uh, now, Kepler actually didn't have gravity as a mechanism. Kepler worked before Newton. So, this is a case where Kepler had great observations to work with, an incredible data set, and he had the Copernican framework that he was trying to support, and he did this yeoman's job to recalculate all this data to support that framework and to come up with this uh, uh, kind of geometrical proof that planets orbit in these elliptical pathways. But he really didn't have a mechanism. He actually thought the sun kind of pushed the planets along in their orbits, which we would now think of as kind of a, a strange way of thinking about things, and that there was some other mysterious force that kept the sun from completely pushing the planets away. Um, so it wasn't until Newton came along and with his universal law of gravitation that we actually completed the picture with a more mechanistic view here of what was going on. Okay, um, now why are uh, planets moving more quickly the closer they get to the sun? Again, if you think about, um, let's say we have a planet here in its orbit, its instantaneous velocity is going to be just straight along that orbit. And what will the sun be doing? Well, the sun will be pulling the planet in this direction, which... Uh, we can actually understand as pulling this way, I should, and a vector of force pulling this way. So it's this vector of force by the sun that will cause the uh, planet to bend in its path and follow that elliptical orbit. But this vector of the sun's gravity pulling is basically opposing the forward velocity of the planet. And what's going to happen to the velocity of the planet in its orbit if the sun is pulling it backward? It's going to slow down. It's going to slow down. And that process will continue up here. Again, the vector pulling toward the sun it can be resolved into you know, the force that bends the path and the force that retards or slows down the velocity. So at what point will the planet be going its most slowest? Uh, yeah, so by the time it gets around here to aphelion, the planet is going to be going most slowly. And then every path, every point along the pathway here, the sun will be pulling the uh, planet to bend its orbit, but will also be pulling it forward. And so that's going to be speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. And it's at this point at perihelion where the planet will be going its fastest, and then it swoops around, not, nowhere near as, as, uh, um, as um, extremely as this elliptical orbit. But then once it swoops past perihelion, as it goes, again, further and further away from the sun, it's going to gradually slow down until it passes aphelion, and then it's going to speed up again. Uh, Kepler's third law, um, actually, I'm, I'm going to skip over all this so we can get to the climate stuff, but I will just say Kepler's third law is not important for understanding the climate of Mars, but critical for understanding the scale of the universe. You know, Kepler's third law basically describes the size of all the planets' orbits in terms of how large the orbit of the Earth is. 
And then once Newton applied uh, universal gravity to that, we understood the mechanism for that, which is you know these equations here and this straight line here. And then once we measured the size of the orbit of the Earth, then we could tell how far away Mars was from the Sun, how far away Jupiter was from the Sun, and so forth. Okay. So, what does this have to do with seasonality as an introduction to uh, climate uh, part of Mars? We have displayed here, not to scale, but in the right uh, order and uh, size of the orbit anyway, and um, the uh, shape of the orbit, the orbit for the Earth, which is in blue, and the orbit for Mars, which is in red. You know, so that's... Oh, how cliched. What do you notice about the orbit of the Earth and Mars? How do they, how are they the same? How are they different? Um, I mean, this is not really showing the ellipse as much, but it seems like the orbit of Mars is a little bit off-center to the Sun. Okay. Compared to the Earth. Off-center? What else? How does the orbit of the Earth look like? What, what shape does the orbit of the Earth look like? Yeah, it's not quite a perfect circle. It is still an ellipse, but it is much less eccentric than the orbit of Mars. So um, as you um, as you decrease the eccentricity of an ellipse, eventually you get down to a point where the ellipse turns into a circle. Earth has a much more even, much more circular, but not perfect circle orbit than Mars. Mars is much more elliptical. Yeah. Does that mean you're going to maintain like uh, more constant, I guess, weather? You're maintaining a certain distance. We'll, we'll talk about weather in a, yeah, well, distance. I mean, you were saying the speed of uh, right. certain parts of the uh, orbit can also affect that. So. Right. So the orbit of the Earth is more circular. If we look at the number of days that each of the seasons takes up, you know, this uh, April, May, June period uh, is 93 days, uh, 93 days for summer, 90 days for winter, 89 days well, for fall, 80, 89 days for winter. Very uh, similar length of seasons. We don't have our winter being much, you know, that much longer than summer, uh, although it may seem like it at times. The case for Mars is quite a bit different, though. First of all, notice that um, the tilt of Mars is tilted on its axis like the Earth is, but um, the tilt is heading off in different directions. So the North Pole of Mars is not pointed at Polaris like the North Pole of the Earth is. So Mars is pointing off in a different direction. So it is during our December, in the point of our orbit, Earth's orbit, where we would be talking about northern winter and southern summer in the December months, that is the time of year when Mars is at its uh, spring equinox. Okay. So basically the Whereas for the Earth, the um, North Pole is pointed off somewhat in this direction. For Mars, the North Pole would be pointed off uh, more in this direction. Okay. So at this point of Mars' orbit, uh, this would be when there is uh, the beginning of uh, spring in the northern hemisphere and the beginning of fall in the southern hemisphere. And then there, at 90 degrees around, um, that would be the summer solstice, where you have the beginning of the summer months in the northern hemisphere, the beginning of the winter months in the southern hemisphere. Um, fall equinox is over here during our, our um, 
at a point in its orbit where in our orbit we would be experiencing June, and then uh, w winter solstice is around here. Now, um, here's aphelion for Mars, and here's perihelion for Mars. So at what point in Mars's orbit is it going the fastest? A perihelion. So it's really zipping along here and going more slowly here. So as a result, um, the um, northern spring and summer on Mars are substantially longer in terms of numbers of sols or Martian days than the northern fall and winter are. And I think that's probably a good place to leave it. We will come back to this after the you know week from uh, well, we'll come back to this just before spring break.